and see until we're live. Okay. The City Council Committee of the Whole will meet on Wednesday, June 22nd at 6 o'clock p.m. for the purpose of discussing ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act, program and funds. This meeting, this meeting shall be held as a hybrid meeting. meeting. Councilors, Councilors shall meet with shall meet in person, person while members of the public, public shall participate remotely in accordance with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and as amended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022. The subcommittee meetings are held to take action for the purpose of making recommendations to the full council. Individuals may participate in person or remotely in the, in the meeting via a remote participation platform called Zoom. Members, members of the of public and or parties with a right and a requirement to attend this meeting may access the remote participation meeting through any one of the following ways. Please click on the link found in the agenda, password 328330, or telephone 853-5257, or 888-475-4499. And again, the webinar ID is 812-1456-5283. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so on matters not requiring a public hearing, we will post on the City of Salem's website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. The City Council Committee of the Whole met in the City Council Chambers on June 22nd, 2022 at 6 o'clock p.m. for the purpose of discussing the ARPA American Rescue Plan Act program and funds. Uh, let's see. Notice of this meeting was posted on June 9th, 2022 at 6 18 p.m. Absent tonight from the Committee of the Whole are Councilors Dominguez, Riccardi, and McLean. Um, and, um, also and also with, with us tonight, tonight we have uh, Dave, Dave Rodriguez, Rodriguez, Anna Friedman, and, and Nick Downing. Um, um, all right, Dave, if you want to start, you can do your share screen. screen. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good evening, Madam President. Good evening, Councilors. Thank you for the opportunity to come and discuss some of the work that we've been doing with respect to the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we have some exciting things going on. Uh, like the President said, I'm joined tonight by Nick Downing, our Federal Funds Manager, as well as Anna Friedman, uh, the Finance Director for the City of Salem. We have a brief presentation. Um, you may have seen this before. Uh, this is very similar to some of the other things that we provided. There is some background information there regarding ARPA generally about how it's structured and limitations, eligibility. Um, we'll try to go through it quickly. Uh, if there's anything, any questions halfway through, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'll ask Nick Downing to come on up. Uh, to we, we're, We've taken the show on the road a couple times. Uh, so we're like the Abbott and Costello of, of ARPA now. Uh, so we should be able to break this down pretty quickly. So I appreciate your time. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, my name is Nick Downing, Federal Funds Manager. Um, some of you might have known me in my previous role the city over in traffic and parking. Um, I joined the team in finance last summer. Um, right as we were really kind of kicking things off here with ARPA in the city of Salem. Um, so just again, quickly by way of background, um, ARPA was signed into law in 2021. That's the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, it created the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, um, which is about $350 billion for state, local, territorial, and tribal governments to respond uh, to the pandemic. Um, funds have, are being distributed to cities and towns in two tranches. Um, Salem will receive a total of about $35 million from the SLFRF. Um, 27 million of that is a direct allocation to cities and towns. 8 million of that is an allocation um, that we're actually technically getting through Essex County um, and much of the rest of the country. They still have functional county government, um, so money was allocated to those units of government, but obviously here that's not the case. Um, so all told, it's about $35 million. Uh, we need to decide how we're going to spend that money by the end of 2024, and it actually all needs to be expended by the end of 2026. Um, there are a lot of uh, ways that we can spend the ARPA funds that we've received. Obviously, um, 
on things that are directly related to the pandemic uh, and other public health um, efforts that are going to build resiliency against future pandemics um, to combat some of the negative economic impacts of the pandemic, uh, household assistance, food, rent, eviction protection, unemployment benefits, job training. Um, also providing services to disproportionately impacted communities. We know the pandemic affected everyone, but it did not affect everyone uh, in the same way or to the same degree. Um, you can provide premium pay for certain frontline workers, the folks who kind of kept things going, uh, especially in those early months uh, of 2020 when a lot of the economy actually just really came to a complete standstill. Um, there is a small bit of infrastructure spending that you can do uh, using these ARPA dollars uh, for things like clean water and drinking water and then for broadband access as well. Um, revenue replacement, so we know that uh, local taxes took a hit uh, during the pandemic uh, and so ARPA allows for uh, cities and towns to designate a certain amount of the funds they're receiving up to ten million dollars um, for revenue replacement and that money can then be used to provide general government services um, so there are significantly less restrictions on that portion of the funding um, and then obviously you can spend it on administrative costs so new staff like myself and Dave um, some of the data collection analysis that goes along with this uh, some assistance with auditing and reporting as well to make sure that we are following um, the huge amount of guidelines that have come out from Treasury about what we can and can't do with this. A um, few things that we can't do, we can't um, make large deposits into pension funds. Um, we can't do, we can't use these federal dollars specifically. In, in certain instances, they've kind of loosened this a little bit about using the, the money for federal matching. Originally, you couldn't use this to, as federal matching. Now, depending on the type of project, there is some allowance to do that. Um, we also can't do kind of broad-based tax relief, so we can't just say, all right, everybody's, you know, property tax bills for the next year or so are going to be lowered by a certain amount. Um, so we do have some restrictions on that. Again, we do have that revenue replacement money that has a lot of flexibility, um, but with the rest of the funds, we do have some, some restrictions on how we can spend that. Um, one of the things that I was uh, tasked with when I first came on was kind of getting the process started for our stakeholder and public engagement. Um, so that included a public survey, uh, included multiple stakeholder meetings, um, a couple of public feedback sessions last September and November. Um, and then that led into the report and action plan that we developed at the beginning of this year, um, which we've presented to city department heads. I believe that document has been shared with uh, the council as well. Um, and then we're having kind of a, a continued public process. So next, uh, I believe it's Tuesday the 28th, um, we're having another ARPA public feedback session and progress report. Um, we're holding that in person across the street and it will be available via Zoom. Um, we will also have Spanish interpretation available as well. Um, and then in addition to that, um, for a lot of the information that you might want to see just kind of as we're rolling things out, um, Salem.com slash recovery will take you to our department page. Um, there you can find the quarterly reports that we submit to the U.S. Treasury. Um, you can also find information about programs as they come online. So um, with the recently completed employee incentive and retention program, um, we had information there where folks could apply for that with um, the festival uh, and special event support program. The forms to apply were, were available through there as well. So that's where the, that will kind of be our library for documents going forward um, and where we'll share additional information uh, as well. So as part of the stakeholder engagement process that was undertaken by Nick and other staff, uh, the, the, the stakeholder group was formed together to formulate a, a set of principles that would govern how we're going to roll these things out uh, over during the eligibility period. So the group itself decided and, and worked with Nick to develop the, the recovery principles that will focus on providing services and assistance to those that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. We'll build resiliency for future pandemics and be financially sustainable. We'll enhance or complement state and federal programs and use recovery funds in creative ways to address local challenges. And but we'll be flexible and transparent with regular reviews to determine if the needs have changed. That includes our reports submitted to the U.S. Treasury, public forums in June and December, like the one that's going to take place next week, our review and update of our recovery principles document annually, and our recovery website with all our reports and plans to be easily accessible, both in English and Spanish. So this, this, uh, all our presentations are up on Salem.com slash recovery, as will this one uh, in the coming days, probably tomorrow. 
Using those principles, we started to develop a strategy on how to roll things out. So our first kind of pillar that we thought about was we, that, we know that COVID's not over, and we know that COVID has evolved over time. So we want to be ready to respond for anything that could happen in the, few, in the coming months as we continue to evolve through the pandemic response. So our continued vigilance and readiness to respond to the evolving nature of the pandemic. We all saw Omicron. Nobody knew that was coming. It was incredibly virulent. But because of our vaccine rollout, we we're able to absorb that in a better way than we were previous variants of the disease. Uh, continued investments into COVID testing as needed, continued resources to get residents vaccinated, uh, resources to strengthen and sustain our public health response, and our public health response investments in infrastructure and critical public buildings. Uh, this includes HVAC work, air exchange, et cetera. The second pillar that we're relying on is our elastic and equitable recovery. Uh, we want to build on the previous work to support small uh, local small businesses during the pandemic, utilizing existing federal funds as well as general funds. Uh, the city was able to uh, provide a level of resilience uh, for, for local small businesses to kind of help to help could them coast through the pandemic. We want to shift that into a recovery effort, making targeted investments uh, towards solving specific economic problems in the community. Uh, we want to direct grant support for tourism and hospitality initiatives, including key events and festivals. Uh, as you can see in front of you, uh, which will also be online, uh, is a breakdown of the uh, grant recipients that have received funding uh, thus far through the festivals and special event program uh, that we developed. Uh, a grant program to support overall wellness programs in Salem. Other targeted investments that will support recovery from the economic impacts from the pandemic and other impacts from the city's response expanding and strengthening food security and access efforts, especially for disproportionately impacted and lower income populations, and measures to bolster mental health supports and programs, particularly those that are responding to direct and indirect impacts of the pandemic on, on vulnerable residents. And lastly, the final pillar is making transformational changes for Salem's future. Uh, we've all heard that this is a generational amount of money uh, that the city receives. I, I don't recall ever seeing a grant amount uh, being directed to uh, local areas uh, in this amount. Uh, that said, $35 million is a lot of money. $35 million is not a lot of money. Uh, we could direct this money towards any one of 10 or 12 different problems and not make a dent. So we want to be strategic. We want to be deliberate and build momentum and get the rock rolling down the mountain a little bit towards things that we're already doing to make tr to continue transformational change within the community. This includes housing initiatives, uh, so housing neighborhood and stability programs, uh, down payment assistance for first-time home buyers, housing rehab and upgrading high-speed internet options, uh, landlord education and tenants rights response as part of our housing stability efforts, uh, program for funding and construction of affordable housing including ADUs, uh, sustainability initiatives including energy efficiency and renewable energy projects, climate crisis mitigation and action measures, projects that reduce the city's overall climate impact and carbon footprint, expansion of the expansion maintenance of the city's urban tree canopy, improvement to green and open spaces in our community that were vastly utilized during the pandemic. We all saw folks use parks and open spaces in new ways, in enhanced ways, uh, so they can get outside and get social. Uh, mobility initiatives, which, um, which Nick can talk about in a little bit, including support for the South Salem commuter rail station project, investments in the city's off streets paths network, uh, micro mobility initiatives and programs, and the Salem Skipper, which has been widely successful. During our phase, so we, we were kind of treating this as phase one. Now, this is our initial thrust into uh, getting some of this money out the door, utilizing the recovery principles and the strategies that were in place. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this um, in a previous meeting, but this goes into a little bit more detail. Uh, the ADU support program, which we're gonna be uh, speaking with, with the Affordable Housing Trust next week uh, to talk about the development and providing grant funding for the development of ADUs within the community with a income with a um, fair market rate restriction place that exceeds the ordinance that's in place currently at 70% of fair market rent. That's going to drop down to 50% if we're giving you this money. The val the purpose, the policy position is saying the value is being returned back to the community through that fair market restriction. Uh, housing stability resources, which is underway, uh, already utilizing CDBG money, connecting tenants with the available resources to continue to uh, push forward housing stability efforts in the community with the Essex County Bar Association. 
And then a generalized investment within the Salem Affordable Housing Trust to continue the work that they do. One of the big problems that affordable housing trusts have is that they're not always well funded. They're not very always well seated. Getting some momentum in place to be able to continue that work is going to be uh, critically important. So that's uh, about a million dollar investment that we want to make in that. Phase one pro, uh, for sustainability, open space, and food security. Kind of batch those together a little bit, but there's a lot of great stuff going on here. Uh, speaking to the urban tree canopy, City of Salem received a $200,000 earmark with, within one of the state ARPA bills that took place. We're going to one-to-one -one match that. We're not required to, uh, but we're going to also provide $200,000 in city ARPA funds to match that state earmark. Uh, improvement to green and open spaces in our community. As Anna spoke about during the budget process and the capital improvement plan, we wanted to identify things that were already in place, capital improvement projects that were there, pull them out, determine their eligibility, and be able to fund those through ARPA. So that's going to vary by project. That's going to be an additional $100,000 investment uh, for this year, for this fiscal year. Uh, investment in the Mac Park Food Farm, um, which has been a critical part of the food security strategy over the last um, throughout the pandemic. That's 95,000, I put about 100,000 uh, that was there because we do want to provide a little bit of flex in there uh, for, for contingency. Uh, kitchen improvements at the CLC. Um, what we did see is that it, although the, the facility itself is rather new, we did realize and we're working with some with, with Terry and Trish down at the CLC that it can it doesn't serve the needs of the community as we need it to. Uh, so we're going to make an investment so that it can. Um, and in a partnership with Route North Shore, uh, a, a great expansion of this is one of the things I'm most excited about is the expansion of the successful meet need programs throughout Salem. But what we want to do, we want to double the amount of programming that we're doing, but target those in areas that we weren't able to do before, especially in, in disproportionately affected communities, so that we're able to spread it out and get more people involved within that program. Uh, Nick, do you want to talk about mobility? Can I just remind you guys to speak right into the microphone? Sorry, we both have our next jobs are as auctioneers, <laughs> so we're definitely, sorry, I was talking too fast. Um, so making a lot of investments uh, in mobility across the city. Um, so uh, first up there on the list uh, is $93,000 to support the South Salem commuter rail station project. Um, so that funding would match the cost of the conceptual design for the project, um, which as we all know is a really important kind of first step in continuing to move that project uh, forward. Uh, a significant investment in the city's uh, bike share network uh, and blue bikes. Um, so we'll be purchasing an additional seven stations and 44 bikes, um, which will be placed uh, throughout the city in locations um, that aren't served by the network just yet. Um, as you know, we had a previous bike share system that was a little bit more uh, extensive uh, than blue bikes. Blue bikes comes with higher upfront capital costs, um, but we're using ARPA to kind of really fill in some of the holes that were left and actually um, with this new round of stations and bikes will actually be uh, a bigger system than we had uh, previously with Zaxxer, so we're really excited to, to take advantage of that. Um, also, um, a planned investment for Salem Skipper um, to support the existing operations. Um, that's uh, the city's rideshare service that we launched. Um, it's been very popular. It's been very successful so far. But as we know, with um, really any transportation product, but especially when it comes to something like a micromobility rideshare project, um, making sure that we can make the investment in that so that the service is available for residents and visitors. Um, you know, those are seldom services that are actually paid for by the actual fares that are raised. Um, but we see a lot of uh, need for this. We think it's an important part of the overall mobility strategy for the city. Um, and so we're excited to, again, kind of take advantage of the flexibility that we have with the ARPA funds um, and make that investment uh, in the Salem Skipper as well. Um, I can keep. So following uh, mobility, our economic development initiatives, uh, some of which have already been completed and uh, or, or, or are underway, uh, the employee retention program, uh, there's also a breakdown uh, that's before the counselors now. Um, that the program itself was designed to encourage the hiring of retention of employees that were affected by the now expired vaccine mandate. The um, program is utilized by 48 businesses. Uh, and 853 employees. There's a deliberate breakdown that's before you guys. Um, one of the things that you'll notice on there is that we provided funding uh, to the employers uh, to cover their payroll taxes. One of the, some of the feedback that we received from the business community was that this is great, 
but it's going to cost me money because I'm going to have to pay payroll taxes on it because it's filtered through the payroll. We were able to structure the program so that we were able to provide a 7.5% increase to their overall grant fund, so they were able to provide that at, uh, and, help, and hold them harmless on that. Uh, outdoor dining, which has been hugely successful, uh, not only in Salem, but throughout uh, Massachusetts. Uh, we want to continue that program. Uh, the, the temporary improvements that have been made down on Washington Street uh, are visible to everybody. Those will be made permanent uh, in the fall. Um, in that in combined with our ADA Improvement Grant Program, uh, that's about $305,000. The ADA Improvement Grant Program is one, some of the feedback that we received from the community uh, was that the outdoor dining was great. It might not be ADA accessible. So we want to be able to provide a reimbursable grant fund for uh, owners to be, if they improve their outdoor dining facilities so that they are uh, ADA accessible, we want to be able to encourage that. Uh, the festival and special event support program, which was rolled out this spring, um, that we've, we have a planned investment of $150,000 for that. I think I believe we've given out just over $79,000 at this point. Um, we want to continue that to roll. That is available through our website uh, at salem.com slash recovery if, if there's any groups. We deliberately made the eligibility pretty broad in that. So we want to encourage all sorts of groups that may have been affected that want to either start a new special event or festival or something that continues. We, we, we're encouraging people to be creative. So this includes farmers markets. And, and the list that you see in front of you is, is great. We were thrilled with the response that we received um, uh, and some of the feedback that we got. And again, in partnership with Root North Shore, um, support for hospitality workforce development to support Salem's hospitality industry in advance of the peak tourist season. Uh, that's one of the targeted investments that we want to make concerning economic development is that we want to be able to get qualified, trained workers inside the hospitality industry in advance of the peak season so that people aren't waiting. People all, if people have to wait, they're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else. We want to keep them here, keep them, keep their dollars here, and make sure that they're well served uh, through this. So Rude North Shore has a great program. Uh, so we engage with them to identify some obstacles and challenges, uh, and we find a way to, to uh, work in partnership with them to help get some of these workers in place. Uh, this is the, uh, the capital investments uh, that we identified from the capital improvement program. Uh, so we started we pull, pulling strategic emergent needs off of there uh, in determining eligibility. Uh, you will see the Charlotte Fortin Memorial Project match. Uh, Nick talked a little bit about the, how the non-federal dollar match works. Uh, so generally, you, we cannot use ARPA money to provide a non-federal match unless we're allowed to, is I think is the best way to put it. Um, so inside the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, we're allowed to use ARPA, fun, ARPA proper funds to do that, but we can always use revenue replacement funds to provide non-federal dollar match. So we're trying to, one of the things the mayor directed us to do is find a way to leverage this money. Spend the money to make more money. So if we can spend $50,000 to get an additional pot of money from the federal government for this project, that's a, that's a wise investment for funds. Uh, so you can see that there's a, a pretty wide diversity of projects that are up there. Um, but these, I believe these have been on the CIP for a number of years. They're well known to everybody. But we're able to pick things off and kind of uh, chip away at them. Um, you will notice, of course, the largest investment in the capital is the police and fire radio communications. Uh, we, were, we were able to find an eligibility criteria uh, with an ARPA proper to use this. That's not revenue replacement. That's an ARPA proper uh, that we're able to use for that. And these are our other initiatives. So they didn't fit in any one of the neat little buckets. Um, so our child care workforce development program, uh, we're working hard on, on this particular project. This is an incredibly nuanced issue, as, as we all know, is that child care is, it, it, People can't work unless they have child care. People can't go to school unless they have child care. Child care is a driver of our economy and driver of our quality of life. We want to try to figure out a way to identify needs and challenges within there. We, we are very well aware that they're making efforts at the state level to do these things. There are things the state can do that we can't do, but there are things that we can do that the state can't do. So we want to make sure that we're working in good synergy with what they're doing and that we're not duplicating efforts, but we're, we're we're augmenting efforts that are going in there. So we're, we're working on this now, and we're, we're hoping to have some of them rolled out in the next few months, uh, especially on the child care workforce development piece. But there will also be some program stabilization and some family uh, access and uh, equity and accessibility issues that we're, we're tackling as well with a, with a small working group. Yes, ma'am. 
Sorry about that. That I'm not loud enough? First time anybody's ever said that to me, I promise. Um, so digital equity uh, is one of, so of course, one of the things that we definitely noticed uh, throughout the pandemic was uh, having equitable access uh, for people to join a Zoom meeting and be able to, to participate in their government, participate in school, participate at work. Uh, so we do have some digital equity projects that are in place right now, that are underway right now, uh, that we'll be rolling out in the next few weeks. Um, one of the key priorities was uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and working with Rahina um, to try to identify obstacles and challenges for these disproportionately affected populations as they emerge from the pandemic. We want to we want to talk, but we also want to listen and hear exactly the experiences that they're having recovering from the pandemic so that we can kind of design programs and design grant programs for us to be able to inject money to kind of help that along, to make that, that recovery more elastic. Um, so we're, we're kind of, we're being very thoughtful about how we're trying to do this, um, and we're engaging with groups that are in play. We want to put the horse before the cart on this one. Um, and make sure that we're listening to the life experiences of the folks that went through this uh, so that we can de design the programs to get the funding to where it needs most. Uh, mental health support is another aspect. It's another one of these incredibly nuanced issues um, that, again, the state's working on it. We're working on it. We don't want to duplicate those efforts. And there's a million things that we can do, and I think there's a couple things that we absolutely have to do. So we want to focus that, and that, that's kind of under development. We had a great meeting with the mayor today on child care workforce, as well as mental health support, so as we start to evolve uh, what these projects look like. And there are always projects and programs and investments uh, that come up uh, that we are able to, uh, that if they fit within eligibility and they fit within the vision and the strategic goals, uh, we're going to jump on those really quickly and make sure we can get this money out the door. So, and that's all I have. Kill the share. Before we open it up, I do want to say that, um, for the record, Councilor Dominguez and Councilor McLean have joined us at 610. Councilor McLean is remote. Um, so first of all, thank you everyone for this. There's so much information here, I'm not even sure where to start, but, um, this is a huge task, and you guys are making a lot of progress on it, and I appreciate that. Um, I noticed the phase one, mm -hmm. phase two and three. Is it, is it three phases, do you think? It's as many phases as we can get in before the eligibility criteria the eligibility period closes. So, so what, what is the time frame definition for phase one? Then? We, we, don't, we don't have a hard and fast time frame for phase okay. one. Uh, we have a set of projects that we're working through. And once we move those, then we'll put them on another batch together and we'll call that phase two. Uh, we didn't want, we want to try to compartmentalize it a little bit, but not too much and give ourselves the flexibility to adapt to changing conditions on the ground. Okay. Can you, can you talk a little bit, I know it's early, but can you talk a little bit about what you're thinking about for the child care issue and for the mental health issue? I know it's early. Yeah. So. No, I'm happy to. And, and so specifically in the child, we know we're going to focus on the child care workforce piece first because we know that the workforce can build capacity. Uh, so it's our understanding that for every one child, early at our child care provider, that's 15 students that can be in, in they can be provided. So if we get 15, if we get 10, 10 teachers, it's 150 kids. That's, so we're going to focus on that. We're examining what the, the obstacles and barriers are specifically. Is it a pay issue? Is it a training issue? Is it an accreditation issue? Is it a, one of the things that we do, we engage with some folks at Salem State, it says, well, how does this work? And they said, well, sometimes the classes are only offered during the day. I say, okay, could we direct a way to have these classes provided? Could we form a cohort and have this class offered at night to provide a little bit more equity? That's kind of how we're thinking immediately uh, for the short term. The split among this issue, and I'm happy to have Anna come up and talk. She's very extremely well versed on the child care issue, is the split between family and home care providers and center-based care. So kind of examining how that works and how that, so 1,400 child care providers closed during the pandemic, 70% of those were home-based providers. So that's a lot of providers and that's oftentimes that zero to three window that it's kind of, the, that's, that's the, the key gap that we want to focus on. 
universal pre-K is great, but that's at zero to three, that's, that's really hard to kind of nail down sometimes. So that's one of the things we're gonna focus on and see if we can get more capacity within the system first and then attack the barriers towards engaging that capacity for the people that need it most. Can I, can I ask you? Sure. If we are um, focusing on the childcare workforce issue if from a Salem point of view, are we, how are we keeping these people in Salem? We're gonna make sure that are we, we not? Yeah, I don't know. So, so we'll, we can structure the program in a way that says, if we're providing you a benefit, you have to work at a Salem-based center. That provides, there's, I don't think there's a way that we can fully restrict it to be, well, we can't build a wall around the city in all, in all, in all policy areas, uh, but if the majority of that benefit is return, being returned back to the city, that's, that's what we're gonna go for. I think there's a sweet spot there. Okay, um, and before I give it up, mental health, just to. Yeah, so one of the things in, in the House and the Senate are, we're, are in conference now regarding this, and some of the barriers toward that, are that's some of the things that we can't touch. Um, insurance providers not, not providing the same level of um, coverage for mental health as they do for health. Uh, that we can't touch that. Licensing, the insurance issues, uh, we can't really provide that, but we can provide capacity in the system. So one of the things we talked about today is can we engage with licensed clinical social workers to provide the service for city employees? Could we provide it for the police department, the fire department, the schools, school-based, school-aged school -age children? And kind of that's how, kind of how we're thinking at the local level, but keeping a very close eye on what's going on at the state level so that we can fill gaps or augment what they're doing here at the local level. This is a really tough issue because a lot of the time it's people just can't find what they need. If you need a licensed clinical social worker or you need a psychiatrist or you just need a counselor or you need a grief counselor or a trauma counselor, there's, def there's definitely, the, everybody's gonna need something different. Um, so being able to provide that is gonna be super challenging, but we're, we're gonna take a swing at it. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Cohen. Um, Council McCarthy had his hand up before me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council President Morcillo. I have uh, two part questions. First, on the ADU, it said spring of 2022. I know you're going to have meetings with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Board, mm -hmm. but when do you anticipate the rollout of that program will be? So the framework of the program exists. The logistics and the kind of the the, the bones of the program exist. One of the issue, one of the things we identified with legal is who is going to be the holder of the deed restriction, and one of the things that legal uh, that that council came back with us and said that the Affordable Housing Trust is the best person to do that. So we're going to meet with them, discuss the program, and hopefully uh, be able to continue. They'll be able to. We'll administer the program, they'll approve the program, so that's one of the things we gotta, we gotta talk through next week. So when do you anticipate it will start? We can flip the switch on that within a matter of uh, a week or two after okay. we get receive approval, so it'll be this summer. So an important component of this, of, of what we're eligible for is uh, climate sustainability and resi resiliency, mm -hmm. and you made a comment that it's always great to spend to make money. I'm going to give you three examples that I hope that you guys will factor in when you're developing that. One is the uh, Mass Save incentive program for air source heat pumps that started in February uh, for the first time uh, applies to commercial properties, which would apply to municipal buildings. And the incentives are good enough to be approximately 30% even more of the project. So that's a pretty good return on investment. But I'm going to give you two that are even better. Uh, Councillor Hapworth had a meeting earlier in the year uh, with uh, city engineer Dave Knowlton about water systems, water pipes. And I brought up something that he said he was going to do research on. In Portland, Oregon, when they replaced water pipes, they put a water turbine, a turbine in the water pipe. They did a stretch that cost $1.8 million. In the first year, it saved $2.1 million. So in five years, a $1.8 million investment will yield a $7 million investment. Better than that, solar panels, which unfortunately in Massachusetts has poor incentives. We, we have a really significant project on the Bentley and the Witchcraft Heights schools. 
uh, $1.7 million of solar, yield about $600,000 in savings per year. A program that doesn't exist anymore is affording the city about $1 million over 10 years in revenue. However, if the city just purchased $1 million of solar panels and at minimum would save $300,000 a year in electricity, those panels are going to produce over 92% productivity in the 40th year. But just 30 years at 300000 is $9 million of savings on a $1 million investment. So I'm just encouraging you for a couple of million dollars out of the $35 million to do something that will produce enough savings for the city to pay for or enable the city to do a lot of other things that you've listed on the report. Sure thing. All right? Well, and I think that's very thoughtful, and we'll certainly take that back. And if you need any more information, you know where to find me. I'm all, I love, all the info that you can give me, I'd love to have it. Councilor McCarthy. Um, thank you. Um, going back to the one of the first couple slides, the buckets that yeah. everything seems to fit into, and then one of the last slides was five million dollars in capital improvements of which when you look at those capital improvements I'm, i think everyone is very worthy mm -hmm. two point two and a half million dollars for a radio system three hundred fifty thousand dollars for the willows pier that list mm -hmm. how does that is that list fit into the overall plan by taking that exemption you talked about nick which was the exemption for lost revenue anticipated up to a total of ten million dollars so that five million in change that's in that bucket that in no doesn't really fit into any other category when you look at them is that how those are getting done because I think that everything on the list you know hundred and fifty forty thousand dollars for the kitchen down the CLC everything on the list yeah. is makes sense to me and is valid for the most part but when you look at the criteria at the start, it doesn't fit into the buckets. So I was like, how are they getting, how are they doing this? And then that one slide that you said, except for we're allowed to take a lost tax revenue anticipation of up to, I think it was $10 million? Right, so and, and just by way of background, initially for the, the lost revenue calculation, um, they made us do an incredibly complex, long, messy, equation to figure out exactly what our lost revenue would have been based on all of these various things. Slide rules, all, the whole, yeah, you don't even, yeah, busted out the TI-83, the whole nine yards. Nice. Then they came back and they got wise and they said, you know what, that doesn't make any sense. We're just going to do a blanket rule that will allow all municipalities to claim up to $10 million of whatever ARPA allocation they have received as lost revenue. Okay. For some cities and towns, that far exceeds what they're actually getting. So their lives were made significantly easier. For Salem, obviously that's a big portion of the 35 million that we're receiving. It's not all of it, but that's the most flexible money we have because that's the money that we can use for general government services. So anything that we could have used regular municipal revenue to buy or program or anything like that, we can use the, the lost revenue funds for that. On that capital list, there are some things that do fit within some of the allowable expense categories on ARPA, but to your point, there absolutely are those things that are not a direct fit there. But we can still use that as long as when we report it to the Treasury, we say, we are spending this money from our lost revenue, and then you know, eventually we will get to a point where we have spent out that $10 million at some point in this program, um, and we won't, be, we won't have those flexible dollars anymore. But right now, you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of those things are going to come from the lost revenue expense category. Some of them we can fit in uh, to other allowable expense categories because the, the rules have changed a little bit as the, the program got finalized. Um, and so some of those allowable expenses, they, the Treasury kind of expanded their definition of what they meant um, as opposed to what they initially had put out. Thank you. Um, if I still, yep. Thank you. Um, and Councilor, I just, just, just kind of piggyback on what Nick said. So in terms of the three buckets that we had up front, those are strategic principles that we're going for. For in terms of eligibility criteria, there's 60 plus eligibility criteria that we're able to kind of slot some of those things in. Okay. So a lot of those are going to fit within there. That includes all the improvements to parks, the water sewer work, uh, tourism stuff, 
Uh, the, the improvements of Pioneer Village, that's, that's an improvement that we're able to fit within an NEC. So we, a lot of that stuff is going to fit within what we call ARPA proper, which is that non-revenue replacement dollars. Okay, that's good. So in phase two, um, piggybacking on some of the resiliency issues as we, as a city, try to move forward with our uh, decreasing our carbon footprint, um, I'm a big proponent of the cliff effect. I'd rather buy something or invest in something that is, is good without getting into a situation where all of a sudden we've been investing in something that sometimes perpetuates itself down the road and then you know in 2027 okay how do we pay for this we were we you know this is something we hadn't banked on how are we going to pay for this so as long as there's some framework if you set a program initially and then figure out a way as you're setting it up to pay for it at the end i understand that as well but i'm a big proponent of cliff effect things so make expenditures so when you look at like our school bus fleet. Oops, sorry. So you got to talk into this thing. Our school bus fleet and our, you know our DPS, our larger vehicles. Obviously, um, they're huge investments, especially when you're looking to go, you know, hybrid or you know totally electric. At what point do we start? I mean, it's not like you can take a school bus and bring pull it up in front of someone's house and plug it in with one of those, you know, cords that you see people using to plug in their, you know regular automobile. I mean, these are going to take huge charging stations. It's going to be a huge investment in order to power up a school bus fleet. Um, at what point do we look at expending some of these funds towards that end? Because once again, those are one-time investments that are going to be, as Council alluded to, pay itself out over time because if, if we're looking to reduce our carbon footprint and one of the largest things are buildings and you know vehicles, then um, the vehicles themselves, A, have a cost, but the charging stations, I mean, does those, I mean, to charge a school bus and to make sure it's charged so it's gonna start in the next morning? I mean, that is, I mean, I'm, I'm being, I'm kind of joking, but yeah. a job I'm doing, I pulled up to the house today and there was basically an extension cord with one of those things plugged into the person's car because they had, had run it into a cord in the house. I mean, obviously you can't do that for a larger vehicle. So at what point during phase two or three are we going to start talking about those types of investments? Because as a city, you know, we're committed to um, lowering our carbon footprint. So, it's, you know, I know that technology changes all the time, but just the infrastructure alone just to do that is going to be astronomical. So. I'll leave it at that. No, Councilor, you make two really great points there, especially with in terms of the, the fiscal cliff aspect of it. We don't, and I can feel Anna looking at me about this right now, <laughs> is that we, we, we are incredibly cognizant about that. This is one-time money. It's non-recurring. We want to make sure that we're using it smartly and that we're not setting ourselves up for fiscal failure in two or three years down the road. So if there are continuing costs, you know, Nick and I sit down and we, we kind of figure out a way to map that out so that if it's something that's that's a key priority and we start with 100% ARPA eligibility and then we phase it out over time so that it is able to be integrated within the general operating budget or other sources or other grant funding, that's one thing that we're incredibly, so we don't, we don't want to shock the budget come the fiscal, the fiscal year where the eligibility period ends. So that's a hugely important point and one thing that we're really focused on. Um, Speaking specifically about charging stations, we don't just focus on ARPA, we also focus on some of the other buckets of money that are out there. And that is a key element of the IIJA, the, the infrastructure bill, the $1 trillion bill that was put out. And it's important to recognize that when they were structurally making things like ARPA and IIJA, they made new programs, but they also funded existing programs. So they had a lot of the eligibility criteria built in place already. One of the key elements of that is charging stations and building up that charging infrastructure. So I'm happy to take a look at IIJA, see if there's existing funding that might be available off ARPA. Keep ARPA as harmless as we can. We'll keep revenue replacement as harmless as we can and see if we can find another source for that. But it's a hugely important point. Yeah, I agree with that. But if you could leverage some of the opera money yep. as a match, then that's, you that's know, exactly right. helps us in the end. And so. that allows us, IIJA specifically allows us to use ARPA proper for the match. So that's statutorily allowed right in there. So. Councillor Hapworth. Thank you, Madam President. Um, first, I just want to thank you all for what, for what you did here. I think um, looking at some of these investments, uh, 
there's a lot of bang for the buck on a couple of these. I think specifically the housing sp stability services, I think dollar for dollar, I don't think there's a better value for our dollars than, than the housing stability services. I think that's something that a, a lot of people don't realize exists and it's been super helpful already and I'm excited to see that investment moving forward. Uh, the outdoor dining also, I think giving our businesses a way to, to potentially double their their capacity, especially in October when, when tourists are around, I think is a, is a huge win for the city and for our businesses. Uh, a larger investment in the in employee retention, but I think if you talk to most small business owners, they, they'll appreciate that sort of thing. Um, the question I have, and I, I absolutely love blue bikes, but the $363,000 for blue bikes, um, if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, what that will pay for, and I guess my question there is when I think about why someone is using or not using our bike share program, I don't know it's the availability of the blue bikes. I think it's, I think this is just my own observation. It's the, the safety of getting from one space to another where we have some great bike, bike lanes, we have other bike lanes, other places where you can't safely get through. So just wondering, I guess, what that rationale was and then if those funds could have potentially been used to expand some of our infrastructure. Sure. Um, so specifically on blue bikes, that investment, um, to Councilor McCarthy's point, uh, covers a few things. So it's for the capital costs for the bikes and the stations, but it's also to phase in the operating costs for the system as well. Um, so I believe the, that what we landed on initially is that the cost to operate these new stations in the first year is going to be split 75-25, 75% coming from ARPA, 25% coming from uh, the traffic and parking budget. In year two, it'll be 50-50 in year three it'll be 25 75 so we had that conversation with Dave Kaczarski to make sure that we were all on the same page with how he was going to build up his departmental budget year over year so we're avoiding that kind of budget shock um, in terms of kind of then how we're actually getting people to use it one of the items that we are funding in the on that capital list is additional planning for off street paths and for bike infrastructure as well. So again, that's money that is gonna be traffic and parking and engineering working together to get some of those things from our bike master plan designed so that we can then, once we have those designs, then we can go out and figure out how we fund them as well. Um, I agree entirely. We have a lot of great bike infrastructure. There's a few little kind of, I think, missing pieces to get to a point where we really have a network um, that people will feel comfortable using. Um, part of what we wanted to do with with this Blue Bikes expansion was to make sure that in addition to actually building out the infrastructure for folks is that we're also then having bikes where we didn't have them before. So when we transitioned from Zagster to Blue Bikes, we'd had a, a smaller overall system. This is really gonna let us fill in some of the holes uh, and the gaps that were created when we did that and then expand the system out a little bit further as well. So just to be, to be clear, um, this could be used, this money could be used for for infrastructure, the, that, that so, wouldn't, it wouldn't be precluded from. So the this money specific for blue bikes is just for blue bikes. Yeah. Ar ARPA in general. ARPA in general could be, yes. Okay. Um, it would need to, you know, we would again try and figure out if there are state or federal programs that we can kind of match it with as well. But generally speaking, we could find a way to, if, if the decision was made to use ARPA for that, we could pursue um, bike infrastructure through, through ARPA, yes. Okay, thank you. Councilor Markle. Thank you, President Marcello, and thank you. A um, lot, of, lot of great stuff here, and it's going to be uh, really helpful, and, and I appreciate it. I, I had two quick questions. Uh, one is about um, the community meeting on the 28th, and I, I think that's great. I have had residents uh, asking me you know, uh, uh, you know, how they could get more information about it, so I think that's terrific. Uh, you had said you'll have Spanish interpretation, and I was just had a quick question. Is that for in-person attendance, or is that Zoom, or both? So the, the interpreter will be in person, and it will, will make sure that they are, it, it's, it's new for me, I haven't run a meeting this way, but we'll, we'll find a way, a way to make sure that the interpretation is visible and available through, through the Zoom portion of the meeting as well. And then we'll also, that's a meeting that we'll be recording, and then once it's recorded, we'll get it up on salem.com slash recovery. Okay, great, thank you. And another one is, um, how does an organization, let's say, you know, a service uh, for our youth or something in Salem, how do they go about requesting the funds? What, what is the process there? So, so that's an excellent question. As, and we're still working out the exact framework of how an external organization could request funds. Yeah. Uh, we do have an internal system that's set up for city departments and, and staff to do that. 
One of the things that we're extremely cognizant of, and we want to be very thoughtful about how we do this, is because it is a finite amount of money, and an infinite amount of asks might come. So we want to make sure that we're that we're make, we're doing so fairly, and that we're engaging ways in a, in a targeted way. If there is a specific organization, I'd love to speak with them, just so I can help learn a little bit more about how that organization has been affected by the pandemic, and how the how we can assist, how we might be able to assist in the recovery, based upon the eligibility criteria included within ARPA. So there are going to be some things that we can do. There's some things we can't do, but I. I want, to, I want to listen and learn a little bit more about what that organization or that individual's experience has been uh, throughout the recovery and how any obstacles or barriers that they're, that they're facing that we might be able to help out with. So it's, it's kind of, I took the long way around on that question. So we don't have it set up yet because we want to, we want to be as fair as we can and not have it be, you know, I, I've described it as the Hunger Games, but we don't want to have it be like that. We want to be as thoughtful and targeted as we can. Okay, thank you. So the, the best way is, is to reach out to you both. Just reach out. Yeah, yeah, we're happy to do it. And if it fits, so the, the, one of the things that we, we encountered is that we had, we, <clears throat> we knew that we had to target, you know, food security was a huge issue that we wanted to target. And there are known players in the community that have had great success and we engage with them in kind of a partnership to say, all right, this is what we're looking to do. How can we work together to do that? And we're going to continue to do that as we you start to explore childcare or mental health or our DEI initiatives, we're gonna start working kind of in that same model. It's been pretty successful so far. So we wanna kind of figure, we wanna keep that train rolling in that direction. Uh, yes, it has been, and uh, your targets have been spot on. It's been great, thank you. Thank you. Councilor McLean, hold on just a minute. Okay, okay. You, you can go. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I have a few clarifying questions and then some comments I'd like to make. Um, my first clarifying question is about the blue bikes, and I would just like to ask um, who actually owns the bikes and the stations? Is it owned by us? Is it owned by the blue bike company? Uh, so the, so city the city of Salem, Salem will, once, once we purchase, purchase stations and bikes, bikes, the city of Salem, Salem owns, owns them. them. Um, so that's so the that's model that's been used um, for the blue bike system. system. Previously, when it was known as Hubway, um, the uh, cities and towns that participate actually own the bikes. They own the stations. What that has allowed for in the past is when there um, was a change in who was actually the operator of the system, the cities and towns didn't need to go out and buy all new bikes and stations. Um, a, different contract was negotiated with a new operator. Um, you know, the new operator came on and they handled, all, a, lot, handled a lot of the rebranding of the system and changing what the bikes and stations looked like, but the, city in, the cities and towns that participated then own the system. That's the model um, that Blue Bikes has used, and it's been successful so far. I mean, they were one of really the only bike share systems in the region that managed to survive the pandemic. You know, Zagster and others didn't make it, um, and so we thought it was a model that had a lot of it made a lot of sense for us. It is more expensive than what we had previously, but the, the fact of the matter is if we want bike share in the city and we want some control over where those bikes and stations are going to be, this is the model uh, that we need to use going forward. Okay, so my second question is relative to the Salem Skipper. Um, I, saw, I, I noted 400K for the Salem Skipper to support existing services. Uh, what, what, what's the result of that exactly? Are we, allowed, are we able to expand services as a result of that investment or is it literally just a cash infusion for existing operations? I'm going to turn this one over uh, to Anna because I think she's been a little bit closer to the specifics about how um, Skipper is being funded overall. Thank you. Hopefully folks can hear me okay. Um, so in response to the $400,000, that doesn't anticipate an expansion of services beyond the expansion that occurred this year. That would help cover um, so the Transportation Enhancement Fund, which is funded by 1% of gross marijuana sales. The, the way that the Skipper program has been funded the past couple of years, because of the timing when the program was initiated and the timing when those funds came in, there was a dynamic where there was some sort of upfront money that helped afford that program. Because of the dynamics of the and the uh, the trajectory of those funds, uh, this four hundred thousand dollars is is likely needed to sort of maintain these services as they exist, uh, without needing to to look into additional funds. And so it doesn't anticipate 
an expansion of funds, but it might anticipate as we are uh, looking at uh, how the program is structured and maximizing hours to the best benefit of the program, but it doesn't anticipate a further expansion beyond the, the um, program that's in place currently. But um, David Kucharski in the parking office may be able to more eloquently answer that than, um, than I have been able to. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, I have my next question relative to Washington Street and the outdoor dining. So I noted about 300K for outdoor dining, which, which the explanation was that was to sort of um, help with, with supporting ADA compliance at those locations. The later in the capital improvements, I saw about 270K for Washington Street. Is that likewise to support the outdoor dining infrastructure? Uh, so the $270,000 is specifically for uh, Washington Street, the improvements that are being made there, uh, the temporary improvements that are being made now, as well as the permanent improvements that, that because of sequencing uh, and contracting, we have to do in the fall after the season. Uh, so we weren't able, but in order for us to capitalize on the outdoor dining season, we had to build something temporary. Um, 35,000 of that 305 will be used to support the ADA improvement program. That's not a hard ceiling. Uh, that's what uh, we're working on based upon what we think will be the, the demand you have to have an existing license uh, for outdoor dining in order to use to utilize that program. Uh, so it's 35,000. If we see a greater demand for that, or we're going to be, be able to be flexible enough to increase that amount or decrease that amount based upon need. Okay, thank you. Um, so my kind of last question relates to the DEI consideration. Um, it was noted that you're, you're, you're working with our new director to identify uh, projects to, to, to sort of get going with. Um, it sounds like you're, you're consulting with stakeholders and I'm a little bit confused about that because we conducted an entire race equity task force already over the past couple of years. I'm surprised that there's, there's nothing, nothing in those in recommendations, recommendations that's ready to hit the ground. I mean, there's there's nothing in that report that is kind of shovel ready that we could be investing in immediately. And thank you, Councilor. That's, that's an excellent point. It's something that got brought up today uh, as we were discussing these issues and that there are a lot of things within the task force report. Um, we do want to work with Rahina to be able to identify some of those things. And we, if there are, uh, I don't want to say shovel ready, uh, but if there are ready, ready to go, ready to launch initiatives, we're happy to move forward with those uh, based upon what, what Rahina's uh, judgment is on that one. Okay. Um, that, that's the extent of my questions, but I did want to share uh, some, some comments. Um, I do I do thank you all for the work you've done in this regard so far. I think this is really a huge opportunity for us, and so I'm glad that you all are putting in the time and the effort to really get it right. I think it's a huge opportunity for us. I'm sure I don't have to convince you of that. Um, the word that really is sticking in my mind right now is transformative. and. It feels to me like while there are many worthy initiatives uh, listed in this report, not all of them are going to be able to receive enough funding to make all of these initiatives really transformative or long lasting. Um, there's a bit in my mind of, uh, of, of, of savings consciousness going on, which is important and a worthy goal for the city, but um, I'm having a hard time coming to term with some of the prioritization, the prioritization um, in those items. When I look at the amount, when I look at the amount of money, collect money collectively that is going to be invested in outdoor dining, dining and on Washington Street, it's nearly half a million dollars. And I compare that to the capital improvement line for our citywide parks, which is only a hundred K. Um, you know, a hundred K is not transformative money for citywide park initiatives. That's quite clear from what we're doing with our signature parks initiative. Um, so I, I wonder when I see things like that, that's something that I hear about quite a bit from my constituents is how are we really making sure that this is something that's impactful around the city. Um, I feel the same way about the investments in the blue bikes and the skipper. Um, you know, three quarters of a million dollar there. Worthy programs, important programs, having alternatives to single car use transportation is important, but I've asked in several occasions in our recent meetings about what the plan is, what is the comprehensive plan for putting together 
alternative transportation. We approved a study to study parking in the downtown. That doesn't include looking at alternative transportation. I asked our traffic and parking director about whether we were addressing this. He stated it's something that he'd really like to look into, but it's not something that's cooking right now. It doesn't make sense to me to spend that much money on something that we haven't even developed a comprehensive plan for. It would make a lot more sense to me to take that three quarters of a million dollars and develop that plan so that we know what we're throwing money at going forward. Um, I feel the same way about the, the, the amount of money that I see in here for festival support. $150,000 is not transformative. And particularly for the arts community that we have here in Salem, who suffered so greatly during COVID, that is not nearly enough money being reinvested. And I don't work directly in arts production, but I do work at an art museum. I'm very familiar with production schedules. Announcing a grant series two months before the project needs to be executed is not the time scale that arts production works on. I would really like to see more investment and more careful thinking in these areas in phase two. And I would absolutely love to see some investment in the workforce development piece of what we're doing relative to our offshore wind marshalling yard that we're working on for the city. In my mind, that is the most transformative opportunity that we have coming down the pipe. We absolutely need to be preparing, putting training programs in place so that people who live in Salem can be made ready to work these jobs and we're not just inviting people from outside the region. I want to make sure that our working class in the city is supported. I think I raised this when we had our first meeting about this. There's nothing in this report about it unless it was something that was stated before I joined the meeting, which I apologize for being late, but we need to be getting on top of that. I want to see that in phase two and I want to see a significant investment in that. I want to see a much more significant in our housing trust fund priorities. I want to see us really dial into priorities. It feels a little small. Though. Any, do, do you guys want to respond to that or do we want to move on or? Yeah, so I apologize. I was just getting some information. So specifically to the $100,000 investment in parks and open space, that $100,000 is just what's coming out of ARPA. That's not what the entire, what the city is going to spend entirely on that. So that's just for the FY23 part of the CIP. Uh, in, in Council McLean, those are, those are points extremely well taken. Um, I, I think, especially as it relates to the festival support program, um, we wish, I wish, I should have rolled it out a little bit sooner, I know that, uh, but we're doing our best to engage with those folks to make sure that they knew about it and that they're able to, to capitalize on it. And that $150,000, simply for spring and summer 2022. Um, and like I said, w with the, the $35,000 for the ADA improvements, we're flexible with that. We, we made up that number based upon what we estimated, what we educatedly guessed um, the demand would be. If the demand is higher, we can, always, we can always invest more money in that. If it's lower, we can reprogram that money into something else. So we're trying to be as flexible as we possibly can to address those concerns. But uh, like I said, your points are extremely well taken, especially uh, as it relates to the, to the OSFOR uh, Workforce Development Program. That's certainly something that I, I'd like to look into a little bit more uh, to see if we can engage and if there's a way for us to operationalize that and make those investments within the community. So, Council Dominguez. Thank you, Madam President. I also want to echo thank you to you guys for this great presentation. And I have to highly agree with the good Council of War for. But I got a couple of questions in regard to inclusiveness. I know you mentioned that you're going to have a public hearing on the 28th. It's going to be a translation, which is good things. But one of the things that we find out is that throughout pandemic is that most of the no English speaker businesses sometimes they get behind, not because of they don't understand, it's because the process is a little bit uh, maybe too high for them to accomplish. And if we wanted to really cover help for everyone, I think that we need to make it easy for everyone, but especially for the more vulnerable one. It is clear that we have so many small businesses owned by. Latino and African Americans, 
and other minority community in Salem. And when it's come to help, sometimes they don't get the help because of what, what I mentioned before. What do you plan to do to reach out to those besides translation, besides maybe the entire outreach that you have done in the past to make sure that they be part of this, so this help that is well needed if we wanted to really bring the economy back? That's one question that you can hold you answer if you want to. My other one is kind of similar, but it's, it's regarding to the employee incentive and retention program summary. I see at least here all very uh, well-deserved businesses, but I don't see diverse here. I don't see any Latino business owner. I don't see any African-American business owner. I don't see the shape of, and the different variety of businesses that we have in Salem. I see many businesses that they need it, but I wanted to see more different kind of businesses so everybody get a little bit of, of, of the pie. What are you planning to do to include and to have those type of business in the equation? This is a final notice right here, or you're going to continue to add more? So for the, uh, for the employee retention program, that program is, was for the winter, and we've, we've closed that. Because it was related directly to the vaccine mandate, we wanted to target those businesses that were affected by the vaccine mandate. Um, if our outreach wasn't effective enough, I, I want to learn how. If there's better, if there's things that we can do better, I want to learn that as well. Um, so if 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 I can engage with you, uh, if you have any ideas on how we can do that better, I'd love to engage with you on how to do that. Um, and we will. If there, there's always the opportunity for us to improve our outreach, um, so I, I want to work with you to do that. Thank you. Uh, final. Uh, you, I mean, I know you respond to Councilor McLean in regard to the. The, the one hundred something thousand dollars that you have, there is any opportunity to increase those numbers into those categories that Councilor McLean just mentioned, or it's already been already budgeted that way. It's, it's open room to flexible to make some change into what you just presented here for the festival program. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. All right. Yep. Thank you, Councilor Prasniewski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. A good presentation. First question is an easy one, I think. Um, is this uh, is your presentation available? Um, can, can we get it emailed to us so that we can um, yeah. be available for us? Because it was short, succinct, and it was to the point. And I like the fact that you folks put in a lot of effort into reaching out to Salem and Salem uh, Salem people and businesses and, and breaking up the pie the, w the way that you did. Um, tomorrow night, the second part of the question, tomorrow night we're going to, we have a council meeting and we're going to be voting on um, some funding issues. Um, and I'm just not sure exactly which ones are going to be subsidized by APA or which ones are going to be uh, on the shoulders of the taxpayers. I'll just, uh, for instance, as I saw during the presentation, $620,000 is for the relocation of the uh, Pioneer Village project is there's also in the council meeting tomorrow night, I think it's, it's a, we're going to be voting on whether to allocate $100,000 to the water system and another $200,000 uh, for the sewerage system. So was that an ex extra $300,000 that's on top of this $620,000, which means now we're talking about nearly a million dollar project, or is this $620,000 part of this water and water and sewer pot. It'd be nice if we knew which money was coming from where, so how it's going to impact our taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for that question. Um, the, uh, the FY23 budget book for the capital plan on page 2, 279 um, in tab 7, it has the capital plan by funding source in there, and so that lists out um, all the projects that are ARPA and all the projects that are by the other sources. The specific project that you did mention, um, the 620000 is only ARPA, and the other items would be in addition to, in addition to that $620,000 uh, portion of that project. Okay, so the, the, uh, the relocation project is nearly a million dollars now. I believe so. I haven't pulled it out here to add it up for you, but I can do that. Okay. I can do that momentarily. Okay. No, thank you. I just didn't know wh where the money was coming from, and that's yeah. my bad for not looking <laughs> at the minor minutiae in the uh, in the budget. Thank you. The um, the I believe that page 
uh, can help for the, what we didn't do, which maybe we could think about doing, is by project that have multiple funding sources, um, showing them in a different way so that you don't have to scroll through multiple pages to try to do that math. Okay, thank you. And just if I could add in one, one point, um, spoke a little bit about the infrastructure bill and some of the other funding sources. Well, one of the critical funding sources is going to be the Forward Act. Um, that's, that's currently before the legislature. That includes $45 million for the Salem Offshore Wind Project, uh, as well as some money for the Willows Pier and a lot of other things. So that's one thing that we're keeping such a close eye on. So that's one element that we're also doing, but that's also utilizing state ARPA funds. Uh, so we want to make sure that all these funds and all this money works together uh, and that we're not duplicating efforts uh, throughout their process. Council McCarthy. I just want to follow up by <clears throat> saying thank you and while I was sitting here during a brief moment, I did type in Salem.com slash recovery, and you guys are spot on. Though that, I mean, I just, I didn't even read it. I just kind of flipped through it real quick to see what was in there. If you could add this presentation to that with some of the other bar graphs that you've got in there and some of the other discussions, anyone who wants to know anything about where we're spending the money and where it's going, it's very well laid out. And I mean, I didn't, I, I just took three seconds and kind of went through it real quick. But it's uh, very self-explanatory. I mean, just, just simply salem.com slash recovery. Hit the link. Boom. I yep. did it myself. And you ask anybody in this room. I'm, I'm a dinosaur when it comes <laughs> to uh, technology. And I just hit it. And I just looked at it real quick. It was bar graphs. Hit the highlights. And I just turned it off. But it, was, it's, uh, it seems like when I go home, I'll flip through it. And if you could just add this to it as yep. well. If you, I know that you said you were going to make this available. But that would be great. You know, Thank you. And, yeah, and so uh, we're going to add to that website as well to have some at-a-glance pie charts so that we'll kind of start at a higher altitude and break it down yeah. so that if even if you don't want to scroll through the federal, the, the reporting stuff that Nick's been working on, that it's a different language for me. Thank God he's here. Um, it would be able to be able to look at it at a glance and figure out what we're doing. I don't know why I'm raising my hand when I'm running the meeting. <laughs> um, can I just add on to that? Any sort of information that you could add to the website as you're going along to show how the money is being spent. So for instance, the housing stuff. If we can add some sort of a graph of how many people this is helping, right? So that we can say, yeah, you know, this is, these are the number of people that were helped to with their ADU conversions, right? Which will house X number of people from our city or from beyond. Um, anything like that is so helpful. It really helps to sell what you guys are doing. You're spending a lot of time on this, and so that would be, and it would help us too, because we can just point people there and they can see how it's being used. Absolutely, and I think that one of the things that's gonna change a little bit about the, the program overall as we're going forward is we're gonna have more projects and programs that are going to have very discernible data tied to them because we need to collect that for the federal reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. So far, we haven't had a lot of that. Um, a fair bit of what we've spent so far has come from revenue replacement, so it's been general government spending, and there's not that data component to it. But as we've gotten into some of these programs that are assisting small businesses, uh, as we're getting into programs that are gonna, going to assist folks with food security, we're going to keep be tracking, you know, number of people served and things like that. So that's data that will start, will then start to populate graphs and charts so that when you go to salem.com slash recovery, you can dive into the depths of the federal reporting if you want to, but hopefully the, the plan is to hopefully also have really easy to digest information there up front that you can look and say, all right, I'm interested in this area. What have we spent? Who have we served? What have we done so far? That's absolutely what we, we hope that will kind of become going forward as we kind of expand the, the spending that we've done. Yeah. So, for instance, like this table here, this is great, and you can just see that there's 853 employees who receive funds. That's amazing, right? That's, that's really good stuff. Um, anyone else? Council Watsonfelt. Thank you, President Marcello. I do have a couple of additional questions. Um, I, I have to say, and I may just be needing to do more homework here, but um, I do feel like there's a, a lack of sort of very specific detail around what projects are getting how much at what point and for what. So you have things like housing rehabilitation on one slide, which doesn't then appear again later. And I know that there's a current program, but I don't know what that means with regards to investment from the ARPA funds. I would love 
love to better understand not specifically um, only how much money from ARPA is going to be put into that program, but is it the same program? Are you looking to augment the program? Are we expanding the program? Is it for anything particular? Um, you know, I unfortunately, something like the housing rehabilitation program, I think, is underutilized. I think it's also under, under misunderstood, sort of, you know, just not quite fully understood. There's a not, um, and this is not feedback for you, this is feedback for the planning department itself, but there could be more information there, you know, even the application itself says limited or some sort of, like, uh, some allowed preservation or something like that. And, you know, the majority of our housing stock that's still owned by our mid- Mid middle income residents are small single family historic homes that are falling apart, yep. mine included. Um, and I think that when you throw something like housing rehabilitation, which we all know preservation is a huge part to the housing stability conversation and the affordable housing conversation and the how we stabilize the market, um, being able to take care of your home is a really big deal. And I would love to better understand like why that appears on one slide, then not again, and I don't know what it means. And if it's in phase one, and so then this is the other, the other sort of space I want to give that, which is if that's a longer term conversation, if it's a phase two thing, if whatever, I'd love to have some better understanding of how, what, what, how we're prioritizing. I think I heard Councillor McLean say the same, how we're prioritizing phase one. What does that mean um, for the long term? Are there other things that we, are there nice to have? Is there a wish list? Is there a phase three that goes out into the stratosphere? Like, what is the plan? Um, because I, I, I personally feel like I don't really have a great understanding of that. So when I ask these questions, I feel like mm -hmm. the answer could either be either we're not there yet or it's on page two and you missed it, right? Like, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's one of the two. <laughs> so I'm feeling a little at sea. Speaking of feeling a little at sea, my second question is um, with regards to climate resiliency for our coastline. So I'm wondering why there's no programming around um, building up our beaches, why there's no programming in here, funds dedicated to seawall infrastructure or um, pumping from, you know, center, center areas of our city back out into the harbor, which of course is only going to help us for another 25 years anyways. But where where is our rising sea level uh, resiliency for, for with regards to, to fundamental infrastructure that's, that, that protects our, our cities and most particularly our really vulnerable neighborhoods like the Willows at the point? Um, so is there, an, again, is the answer that's phase two or is the answer that's on page two and you missed it? <laughs> so uh, speaking to the, specifically to the, uh, to the housing rehab part of it, I, th I believe that appears as, as part of one of the strategic goals uh, that we want to look into as it goes through. The home program specifically is carved out within the final rule as if it fits the eligibility, this is one of those elements that it says, if the eligibility for one program exists, it works for this program as well. So that the home program is one of those. And that they said, okay, if we're not gonna make up eligibility, if it fits for home, it fits for us, go. We're not there yet. And I think it's the, is the best answer. Um, as, as, and those are, like you said, those are complicated programs that are often misunderstood and that they're gonna have to, we're gonna have to undertake a lot of development in order to do that um, and get that, get that to where it needs to be so that the money can be utilized within the eligibility period. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you see within that quote unquote phase one, this is, this is easy, not easy stuff, this is low hanging fruit. This is stuff we were able to charge ahead with right away and we're able to start getting the, the money out the door. One of the things that, that we talk about a lot is how to strategically use the money, so within the eligible, eligibility period, but also as it exists within the political climate. And so one of the things that we're very cognizant of is that there might be political upheaval that happens in Washington and that you may have heard that there might have been an effort to claw back some of the ARPA funds because cities and towns weren't spending it fast enough that didn't get, thankfully didn't get traction and we received our second tranche. One of the things that we're, we're gonna be kind and we were talking about this today is that there could be an element of you know, we're gonna offset other federal funds because you got this amount of ARPA once if there's a political change. And so we're, we're very cognizant of that. So we wanna to try to balance off that sort of reality, get things done, but also be ready to use the money for things that we need to down the road. Namely, our response efforts for COVID if things change. If things go to hell and we have to stop and re-augment and reprogram all this money towards our, towards, our, towards our response, we're prepared to do that. So we want to be able to build momentum in certain programs, be flexible enough to be able to adjust to changing, to changing conditions, um, 
it also be able to get some of the things done that we all want to get done. Speaking specifically to the climate piece of things, our climate is a priority with an ARPA, and it's a priority for our strategies. One of the ways that I, is that I don't, and Nick and I talk a lot about eligibility criteria like big old nerds, but one of the things that I don't think would be eligible would be things like seawalls. It would have to be an element of climate resiliency as it relates to existing uh, water and sewer work. So if, if things fit, and this is a, yeah, another one of those, uh, priority. So one of the eligibility criteria is if it fits within the drinking water state revolving fund or the clean water state revolving fund, it's eligible for ARPA funding. However, they'll prioritize programs that have a climate element to those programs. So like you said, a pumping station, Ocean Ave pumping stations in there, that's what one of the, it's slam dunk for us. We're able to do that. But a seawall or beachhead or other of those or living shorelines or, so, or any of those, those sort of element, those would be a tougher sell under ARPA. Uh, it has to have some sort of other drinking or clean water SRF eligible project associated with it through that infrastructure. And Nick touched upon this earlier, the infrastructure part is pretty narrow, but we're getting very creative on how we're gonna kind of widen that a little bit to talk about. So like Councilor Happer talked about some of the bike stuff. We're gonna expand that to be able to, to include that. So there's gonna be climate elements to some of the infrastructure projects, but it might not be always the things that we want to do uh, in terms of the, what you're talking about in the shoreline enhancements. So just to respond, my, let's go back to the housing rehab program for a yep. second. So it sounds to me like though it appears on a, a, a slide, yep. it's still rather aspirational. There's no shape, format, structure to that. Not yet, not yet. And if there's things evolve, that might have, that might be Something that we're gonna we're gonna go headlong into, but these are the phase one stuff is like I said, some of the stuff that we're prepared to start running into pretty pretty quickly. So I would I would offer um, that housing rehab programs, though not as maybe not feeling as urgent mm -hmm. as the workforce child care, is a similar kind of thing, right? We have we are losing residents. They're selling because they they can't afford to maintain their homes. Um, and they're selling and they're getting flipped and there goes the domino, right? And so I think that we're losing residents. We are losing housing stock. And I, 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 I feel the personal um, sort of pressure of that. So I would consider it a similar kind of approach sure. um, just with how you prioritize. So then the next, the next question I have, my third question is just about the mental health, which I know we sort of started to talk about, but I think I heard you say earlier, and I, I'm hoping I'm wrong, um, that the, that the investment so far would be predominantly around programs supporting city employees. That's one aspect of it. Uh, that was mostly just me freestyling or, or kind of brainstorming. Riffing. But that, yeah, that's, that's one thing that we could do as part of that. No decisions have been made and we want to kind of analyze it in a holistic way. And we're not, we're not married to any, pro any proposals yet. Uh, we're still in formation now. Okay. Yeah, because it did appear on a slide with like no details, yeah. no phasing, yeah. no status update, nothing. Yeah, it was, that, that was just to let every like to let the counselors know as well as the public. It is on our radar screen, and it's it, we could go any one of a million different directions in that, and we want to make sure that it's targeted. We don't want to just. It would be easy for us to just throw money at a problem and walk away. We don't want to do that. We want to make targeted, meaningful investments, and so that's one of the things we're we're content to kind of slow down take it apart, engage with stakeholders, and find a good solution for everybody. I think that whatever programming gets funded through this, like you said, it needs to be able to be sustained over yeah. time for sure, but I also think it really, really needs to have a wide public focus, whether it's a community resource center, you know, yeah. program, or it's helping whatever the school system's about to launch um, for the mental health of our kids. Whatever the case may be, it's really, it's really got to be externally focused. I, I know we were really, I think, all really unanimously proud to support um, the increased funding for the CIU mental health staff um, for the PD this year. Mm -hmm. But I also know that that's just still not stemming the tide, no, right? It's, yeah. It's one piece of that puzzle, and yeah. we want to we want to bake the whole picture. So it's it's, right. it's a very thoughtful comment, and I appreciate yeah. it. And I think that with the community health going to be expanding down, you know, hopefully the Lafayette Street location coming in the next few years, there are a lot of opportunities for access. Mm -hmm. But we need the people, so we need to invest. We need to invest in the programming. Yep. Um, that's what all I had. Thanks. Okay. 
Can we go back to the Ocean Ave stormwater drain, the pump station? Sure thing. <laughs> That's my ward. <laughs> um, is that the full cost? Is that the three hundred and seventy thousand dollars? How much is that covering? I know. It's not the full. It's not. No. The, I wish it was. <laughs> what What does it cover? That might be the design. That might be the design work. For like it. the final design, because I know that there was a preliminary design. <laughs> I'm hoping it's close to being done. Yeah, we're just lo we're, we're okay. looking it up right now. Okay. Councilor watson -Felt. Thank you, President Masurla. While, while Anna's looking that up, I would love to understand kind of in a visual way, not only what the work is that's being done um, that people can access, which really shows off the good work that, that we hope you know this money is going to do, um, but also just that long-term phasing of where projects are falling and, and just being really transparent, like even if it's a wish list, even if it's like a we don't know, but we care about this thing, um, that would be really helpful. I think you know the one slide you had that has a sort of blurb description and then a status of we're in ideation, we're in reimagining, we're in whatever. Like that's, I think that's really imperative to help understand um, um, what the plans are for this long term. This is a lot of money and I think that, you know, to, to Councillor McLean's point and to yours as well, sir, it is both transformational and nowhere near enough, right? So, so um, just whatever level of transparency you can bring to that planning process I think is really key. Thanks. Do you, do you have easy ways for the public to put in their ideas for, I was just thinking like the mental health thing where you're still trying to wrap your arms around what we could do as a community. Um, is there a place on the website where they can easily say, this would help me or this would help people that I know? It's certainly, right on, right on Salem.com slash recovery, right at the bottom is both of our email addresses. No such thing as a crazy idea. We love we love everything that we hear, and we're, we'll we'll be able to intake that stuff pretty quickly, and we respond to all that stuff almost immediately. Is there anything more direct than that? Um, I mean, I think it needs a call out. I think maybe okay. maybe to Councillor Watson Felt's point, where you have things that you're still kind of trying to figure out how you're going to do it. Maybe you have that on a separate page with you know, a link that says, send us email if you have ideas, or, you know, and then you know exactly what they're trying to send you info on, this particular topic. I don't know, just make it a little easier than, well, our email's on the bottom there. So, so like, more categorically, like, categorically yeah, yeah. specific. So, yeah. just, all right, if you have an idea yeah. as to what the city should be doing on mm -hmm. mental health support, yep. send it in. That'll be, some form will come in to us. Okay. All right. Yep. Yep. It should be easy. Any more info on that pump station? Unfortunately, my laptop is not fully cooperating, but uh, based on what I'm looking at in our capital plan, um, which I just lost here, so it looks like $150,000 has been previously approved. Uh, the request going into next year, um, I believe is 370,000. I hope I'm looking at the right thing. And then we have a placeholder for a future year of 8.5 million. For, for when was that? Uh, 8.5 million. It's, it's just a placeholder in a future year right now in the capital plan. Okay, just, okay, yeah. got it, thank you. And I'll check in with Jenna I just to make sure that those are the uh, latest and greatest numbers on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anything, Council McLean? Nope. So at this point, I would, I would, I could see keeping this in committee and asking you guys to come back um, in a couple months to get another update. Sure. sure. I Council move, McCarthy. I, I move that we keep this matter in committee. Second. Council McCarthy moves that we keep this in committee. Seconded by Councilor Watsonfelt. And we are going to do a roll call vote. Uh, Councilor Cohen. Yep. Councilor Dominguez. Yes. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council McLean. Yes. Council Merkel. Yes. Council Prosniewski. Yes. Council Varela. Yes. Council Watsonfelt. Yes. And myself is a yes. Passes 10 to 0. And Council McCarthy. I move to adjourn. Council McCarthy moves to adjourn. Uh, we'll do another roll call. Councilor Cohen. Yes. Councilor Dominguez. Yes. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor McLean. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. 
Councilor Posniewski? Yes. Councilor Varela? Yes. Councilor watson -Felt? Yes, and thank you to everyone. <laughs> and myself is a yes. That passes 10 0. Thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate the information. Good night.